Welcome back to Tactical Accountants, my fellow quarantiners. The stay at home order continues, in our state at least. So I thought what I would do tonight is discuss something that you've seen on the channel before. Uh, it's no secret that I own and I'm a fan of the Ruger Precision Rifle. Um, I wanted to go through some of the things I've learned about this platform in the time that I've had it, as well as some of the upgrades I've made. So stick around. Uh, this is going to be a lot of talking. Grab a cold beverage of your choice. I know I am. So cheers, guys. Let's get to the content. I've had this Gen 1 308 Ruger Precision Rifle for over three years now. I've put at least 2,000 rounds through it, probably closer to 3,000 rounds, most of which is this stuff right here. Tula steel cased, 165 grain soft points. Definitely seen those on the channel before. That, believe it or not, is a five shot group at 100 yards with Tula 165. So around three quarters of an inch. I think that's pretty impressive. Um, of course, Tula isn't the most consistent load, so just above it, we have a two inch group with the same load on the same day. But what I am saying is, if I do my part, I'm doing my part too. <laughs> with Tula, it's not all that bad out of this rifle. Getting to shoot a 308 load at around 30 cents per round um, and consistently ringing a six or eight inch gong at 200 yards or a 12 by 20 silhouette at 600 yards. <laughs> Knowing that you have that ability to train for cheap and you're still the limiting factor rather than the rifle, that's a big selling point for me. When you step up and shoot something more fitting of the precision part of the RPR's name, something like this Federal 175 grain gold medal match. This exact rifle has put five rounds into around a half inch at 100 yards. Check out our accuracy test video of it for evidence of that. Uh, when I got this rifle, I was not yet shooting uh, precision rifle series or PRS style matches. In fact, I didn't know what that was. Um, the first season I competed, I shot this very rifle in 308. And I can confidently say that I was the limiting factor, much more so than the rifle was. It is more than accurate enough. Um, let me get behind it a little to show you the action. So with the Ruger Precision, you get a 60 degree bolt throw. Uh, it may not be the smoothest in the world. Um, I say that relatively speaking. It does seem smooth, I'm sure, when you see me cycle it. But compared to something uh, more premium, more Gucci, like uh, the custom build you saw on this very channel compared to this rifle, Machix build. I mean, there's just no, no ifs, ands, or buts about it. When you take a thousand dollar action, a naked action, and compare it to a rifle that costs a thousand dollars in its entirety, there are going to be trade-offs. With that said, this action is pretty quick. Like a lot of us, after I got a taste of competition, I kind of caught the bug uh, and I started considering what could make me more competitive uh, as a way of throwing money into it as opposed to improving upon myself as a shooter. I'm sure you all know that feeling. So this one has stayed 308, but I was able to keep it around as a training tool and just a fun gun to shoot and something to hunt with because of, I'm sure you've seen it in the background here, So this is my second Ruger Precision Rifle. Um, I got it around a year ago from Grab a Gun in six millimeter Creedmoor. Uh, they were having it for a, frankly, too good to pass up price. It was going for under $800, a complete rifle. Um, my 308 when I got it was over $1,000, so that's a no-brainer. You saw it on the channel before, shooting out to 1,000 yards in the desert in Wyoming. Um, it has since gotten some upgrades that we'll discuss. So before we get to the rifles, let's compare the calibers. Uh, my first precision is still chambered in the tried and true 308 Winchester. So here you have a 175 grain bullet going around 2,600 feet per second. The biggest perk with that is energy at the muzzle and of course barrel life. Uh, you can expect a barrel to last at least 5,000 rounds. That's definitely appealing. 
Moving on to 6.5 Creedmoor, everyone's heard of it. Here you have around 140 grain bullet going around 2,800 feet per second. Uh, shorter barrel life at around 2,500 rounds, give or take. Uh, less recoil, of course, with a lighter bullet, uh, less drop, less wind drift. And then six millimeter Creedmoor, like six five, but even more neck down. 105 grain bullet to 108, going around 3,000 feet per second. So even less drop, um, quicker velocity, but also shorter barrel life at around 1,500 rounds potentially before you want to swap that barrel out, but also the least recoil of the bunch. So 6.5 is being discussed because the barrel on my formerly 6 millimeter Creedmoor uh, RPR is now in fact that 6.5 barrel that I picked up. It is a Faxon Firearms barrel, unfortunately discontinued now as far as I can tell. It is 24 inches with their heavy fluted profile. Looks pretty cool. In hindsight, uh, I don't know if I would have gone with fluted as opposed to just a heavy barrel. But there it is, this rifle yet to be fired uh, in 6.5 Creedmoor. Uh, one public service announcement. Up top here on the RPR, you have your factory 20 MOA rail. Um, it is attached with these four bolts. Hopefully they are in focus. The reason I mention these while I have the optic off this rifle before zeroing it is during one of my PRS matches, I couldn't hit a target to save my life. I thought there was a problem with my scope. Only later in the day when I was shooting groups that I noticed that the entire scope on its mount was wobbling because this rail was wobbling. So when I got this second rifle, the first thing I did was Loctite it and torqued these four bolts. I suggest you do the same. So for modifications, I'm gonna start with the ones that are identical to both rifles. I try to keep the rifles identical as much as is practical um, for training purposes and just to appease my borderline OCD. So down here we have the grip. You can tell by this hump here that this is not a regular Magpul MOE. It's the MOE K2. It's really nice because I'm gonna go with this hand. You can see that hump, it just naturally indexes your hand. So you get a very consistent grip every time you pick up the rifle. Um, I like how it feels and you really can't beat it for the price. You can pick these up for around $15. Uh, moving on to the bolt knob. Next thing you're gonna notice, that bolt knob is made by a company called MG Tactical. You can find these on Amazon. Believe it or not, they're around $20, which is a great price. It's roughly half of a lot of the knobs you see on places like uh, Anarchy Outdoors. I have noticed a difference just dry firing uh, between this and the factory bolt knob. This longer section being textured gives you more purchase and for me at least allows for a more consistent uh, grip when working the action quickly. At the back of the bolt that is the Anarchy Outdoors titanium bolt shroud. Um, I'll take it out give you a better view of it. Not only does it match the finish of the bolt perfectly. So it looks really nice. Uh, titanium, as we all know, is one of the strongest metals, if not the strongest. What that means is when it's interfacing with steel, it's not gonna get worn away. The bolt is made of steel, so the titanium is gonna hold up. The reason I bring that up, let me just reinstall that here is prior to running the Anarchy titanium bolt shroud, I had an aluminum bolt shroud made by a company called uh, Long Rifles Inc, I believe. I don't mean to rag on their product, I'm just sharing a personal review. Uh, the aluminum looked fine and worked fine for a while, and then during one of my PRS matches, the rifle started feeding really roughly, and I had trouble working the bolts. it turned out is that the steel of the bolt had won the battle against the aluminum of the bolt shroud and the aluminum had actually started to wear away in places allowing the shroud to move on the bolt 
and obviously interfering with the smooth, smooth operation of the bolt. So uh, this titanium one, so far, no problems. I have it on both rifles. I highly recommend it. Uh, one more thing that you can't tell um, just by looking, this is internals. Let's say you're shooting a stage in a PRS. Um, you have a small steel target three or 400 yards away. You're shooting off of a barricade, off a bag, so you're not in the most stable position. You break the shot, let's say you hit. It's time to reload. This action, I'm gonna do it by lifting the bolt handle. You can see by just lifting the bolt handle, I'm moving the rifle. That may not seem like a big deal, but when you're doing it under stress and against the clock, the smoother you can get that next round in without upsetting the rest of the rifle and getting back on target, that might be the difference between getting another hit on a stage. So I looked into options to improve the weight of the bolt lift on the Ruger Precision Rifle and found uh, an upgraded cocking piece also sold by Anarchy Outdoors. Uh, I'll post in a photo of it and also a link in the description. And it's made of a smoother and harder steel. And actually by using this uh, Lyman trigger gauge, wasn't the most scientific method. I actually put a zip tie around the bolt handle and tried lifting it before and after. That cocking piece did uh, reduce the bolt lift by around one full pound. So that's definitely a worthwhile upgrade. I have it done to both rifles. Again, I'll link to that, but you can't see it. And from the outside, this is a factory Ruger Precision Rifle trigger. I removed the trigger adjustment spring altogether. So there are plenty of videos showing how to do that. You can find it on the forums. And now let me show you in real time what the trigger pull is like. So here we go. Depressing the blade. Depressing the blade is around 11 ounces. So the Ruger Precision is technically a single stage trigger. I'm a fan of two stage triggers, but to me that blade makes it effectively a two stage because I have to be deliberate to pick up that slack in the first stage to get the trigger to break. So we're at 11 ounces, give or take, for that first stage. And then let's see the break. One pound, 14 ounces. Do it again. Again, 10.5 ounces for the blade. One pound, eight ounces. So there you have it guys. No trickery on camera, just by removing the factory spring in your uh, Ruger Precision Trigger, you can get it down to 1.5 ounces, effectively still being safe. You can see there, if I don't depress that blade, I cannot make the gun to go off. Um, very little creep, very little over travel. And to me, it's just, I don't need a better trigger than that for $100 or more it's not worth it for me. Uh, your results may vary. If you're happy with your Timney, more power to you. I'm gonna stick with this setup. I would recommend stopping at removing the spring though um, and not modifying the trigger anymore. The reason I say that is one write-up I found said not only to remove the spring, but to try polishing the uh, sear. Um, the surface a little bit uh, to try to get rid of that creep. I did a very minimal amount of that polishing. And then when I went to reinstall the trigger, that trigger would not reset reliably. I don't know why that is. Sometimes running the bolt fast, it would reset. Sometimes the blade just would not reset. And I would go to take a shot and find that I had a dead trigger. So I actually went to a Sniper's Hide forum. I found a really helpful guy willing to sell his factory trigger for a good price to do me a solid. Uh, I went ahead and removed just the spring on that. So currently 
I have two factory triggers with just the springs removed and they reset 100% of the time and I'm very happy with them. I would not recommend trying to polish anything because that's how I uh, broke, as far as I'm concerned, my third factory trigger. As you can see, factory stock here, factory stock here. Some people like to rag on these stocks, calling them cheap, saying, you know, they're a nightmare and they need to be replaced uh, as soon as possible. I've had zero issues. Uh, they're adjustable, they're comfortable. Uh, they fold out of the way just fine. I see no reason to drop a $200 Magpul uh, precision rifle stock on these. If you do, more power to you. Um, up front, again, that is the 6.5 Faxon barrel. And for a muzzle brake on the 6.5, I have the APA Little Bastard. I believe that's a Gen 2. So that's nice. One nice thing about it is you don't need to use a crush washer and uh, retard strength to get it installed. It's nice and easy. Looks mean. And on the 308, that is still the Precision Armament M472. This thing has a tremendous amount of blast, but it works really well. Moving back to the handguards, on the 308, we have the factory Samson key mod. It's not great, not terrible. Whereas on the 6 mil, or 6.5, I'm sorry, we have the Seekins Precision with the flat bottom that was installed newly along with the barrel. So if you've ever wondered why handguards or stocks on competition rifles often have a flat bottom, this is the reason why. That Seekins Precision handguard is balancing the rifle without anybody holding it. Now, to be fair, there's no scope on it right now, so it's more front heavy than it would normally be. But as you can see, it is balancing perfectly flat on this surface uh, without any intervention. In comparison, the factory Samson handguard on my 308 Gen 1, any movement whatsoever with the round bottom of the handguard results in the entire rifle rolling around. Why is that a problem? Because when you are shooting on the clock, uh, you break a shot, let's say you hit, let's say you don't. In any case, you have to work the bolt, move the rifle slightly, get back in the scope. And because the rifle is rolling around on the handguard, you have to make sure your scope is level before breaking the next shot, especially if you are not dialing in but relying on your holdover hash marks. So that's it in this tale of two Ruger Precision Rifles. I'm pretty sure I discussed everything I wanted to discuss there, and I'm quite sure this video will be longer than I'd like it to be. Uh, I know I'm long-witted. I apologize for that, guys. In any case, in three years of owning this Gen 1 308 and one year of owning this Gen 2, formerly 6mm Creedmoor, now 6.5. I'd like to think I learned a few things about this platform. I know I have a lot to learn yet. One thing I'd like to learn especially is just how accurate this 6.5 barrel will end up being. Um, so stay tuned for that. Looks like we have plenty of time ahead of us to record before we do get back out at the range. Like a lot of you, I know I'm dying to get back out there. Um, but this situation reminds us that there are more important things. So stay safe, guys. Stay healthy. We're all in this together, and we'll catch you next time. See ya.